Arsenal are set to have a big summer spend. Meanwhile, we need to talk about Matteo Genduzzi. And we've got reaction to last night's Champions League football and a look ahead to tonight's action. This is the Arsenal News Show. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys and girls for another episode of what is our Arsenal news show. Joining you every single morning at 8am UK time. Thank you so much as always for joining me and making this a part of your morning routine. It is very much appreciated. I hope that you'll drop a like on the video and help us to 1k every single day uh, as we aim to try and again show the power the ability, the camaraderie is the right word, I think, uh, of this amazing community that we have here at the channel. Good morning to those joining us live in the chat box. Uh, good morning to Damien, to Maximius, to Thomas, to Rich, to Blackshine, to Glenn, Matt G, Mr. Reed, Temi, uh, Masinguzi, uh, Arsenal Adventure, Pat, Martin, uh, Vivian, Louis, uh, Ismail, Carl Kish, uh, Kaiser, Input, and Marcus. And thank you so much to everybody else, of course, joining us too. It is hugely appreciated. Really appreciate your time uh, to tune in. And as I say, make this part of yeah, your daily routines. Um, if you could drop that like and help us to that 1K, it would be heavily appreciated. Uh, we'll jump straight into today's stories, I think, and not waste any time. Uh, yesterday evening, we saw the Champions League uh, take place. The first round of the second legs results of the last 16 of the competition. Bayern Munich went into their game against Lazio 1-0 down following their defeat um, in Rome before a 3-0 win on the evening. Uh, we saw a goal, of course, from uh, Harry Kane uh, to level things up and then a goal from Thomas Muller to kind of press home the advantage before uh, another goal from Harry Kane in the second half has really done plenty to alleviate some of that pressure from Thomas Tuchel as well. Now, Real Sociedad were unable to turn around their scoreline against PSG in their game. They were already going into the game 2-0 uh, down from the first leg, and they were quickly 3-0 down when Kylian Mbappe scored after 15 minutes. Uh, he then put a second in the back of the net in the second half, and a sole consolation from Mikel Moreno towards the end of the game was far from enough to get the job done for Real Sociedad. And so PSG and Bayern are indeed our first competitors in the quarterfinals of this season's Champions League. Arsenal, of course, take on Porto in their second leg game next week. And then tonight, we've got Manchester City against FC Copenhagen. They already have a 3-1 lead, uh, lead that they took home from Denmark. And then we've got Real Madrid against RB Leipzig. Real Madrid with the 1-0 lead following their win in Germany. So I'd expect still City and Real Madrid to progress. And then, of course, we'll be facing the big questions of whether Arsenal will do the business on their end. Uh, come, of course, uh, <laughs> come, of course, that next week game, which I cannot help but get incredibly anxious about somewhat. Moving forwards, and Saka has won Arsenal's Player of the Month awards. However, he was snubbed. From the Premier League award, Rasmus Hoyland picking up the award for his contributions to Manchester United's February. I can't help but feel that Saka has been particularly hard done by an Arsenal team that has utterly dominated sides during last month. It's been an amazing month of football for Arsenal that has only continued into this month and seen Arsenal pick up their next massive victory. But don't forget, February is a month that saw Arsenal beat Liverpool 3-1, beat West Ham United 6-0, beat Burnley 5-0 and beat Newcastle 4-1. And Saka was important to all of those games. And somehow, some way, Manchester United's Rasmus Hoyland picked up the awards instead. I don't get it. I don't really know how, but uh, at least he's won our Arsenal player of the month because it's appreciated by us as this Seeming agenda continues to perpetuate through the league and uh, pundits and, and the like as well. But uh, Rasmus Hoyland, the player that picks up the award, the Premier League over Saka, who wins the Arsenal Player of the Month award. Now, uh, I, this was uh, news that came out a couple of days ago, but we haven't had a chance to discuss it. So I'm bringing it up now. Uh, Paul Tierney will be the VAR official for Arsenal's game against Brentford this weekend. This is despite the fact that Tierney, of course, made that significant error 
in the game between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, which led to Liverpool being given back possession of the ball, despite the fact, of course, that Nottingham Forest uh, should have been in possession. And then, of course, that led to the build-up to the corner, which eventually led to Liverpool scoring their 99th minute winner in their game. He will not take part as a referee for any of the games this weekend, as I would assume, some kind of um, repercussion of the weekend. I can't help but feel that this is an incredibly light, if it is indeed anything other than a, a punishment. There's been recently a lot of controversy in Spain. Um, referees, uh, the referee that made the error supposedly in the game between Real Madrid uh, and Valencia at the weekend. I believe that he's been suspended for two weeks' worth of actions. Indeed, uh, just checking this, uh, according to uh, Archio VAR, uh, Gilles Manzano has been suspended by the Technical Referees Committee for his mistake during Valencia-Real Madrid, and he is suspended for two matches pending a final verdict. Um, really kind of... And, and the thing is that Mike Dean was speaking about this on Sky Sports and said that it's a monumental error that Paul Tierney made during the game between Nottingham Forest and Liverpool um, because it's just written in law that Nottingham Forest should have been given the ball back and not Liverpool. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a strange one. Uh, It's a very strange one that Paul Tierney's not faced further repercussions for is just by the letter of the law, a mistake um, that was made. So, and he will VAR the game between Arsenal and Brentford. Now, Matteo Genduzzi, uh, believe it or not, has come back into the Arsenal sphere and uh, has brought himself into the headlines. He conducted an interview with The Athletic uh, recently, uh, but he did speak about um, his time with Arsenal and he's made me hold my hands up and say, fair play, Matteo Genduzzi. Now, if you've listened to the channel for quite a while, you know I'm not the biggest fan or haven't been the biggest fan of Matteo Genduzzi. I wasn't a big fan of his actions at Arsenal. I wasn't the biggest fan how his time at Arsenal came to an end or his behaviour or the way in which he uh, kind of broke the principles that had been laid out by Arteta and some of the incidents that went on behind the scenes. Well, he's done an interview with The Athletic where he said, I didn't work with Arteta a lot. I only had six months. I was 19, so I was learning every day and I wouldn't make the same mistakes I did when I was 19. But in football, every day you learn and mistakes are part of football. Mistakes are part of life. You become a better man and a better footballer with mistakes. And for me, it was a very good club because I played a lot. Arteta is doing a very good job at Arsenal. They are fighting for the title and they are a very good team and he's done amazing things. I hope they will get a trophy because Arsenal is a big club. I wish the best for them. And I think that it's important always to say things like second chances are important. I am always open to give somebody a second chance, especially if they can hold their hands up and say, you know what, I got that wrong or my previous behaviour was not okay. It was not good enough. Second chances are important. It's what makes us human. And so therefore, I say fair play, Matteo Genduzzi, for speaking the way that he spoke and for admitting the mistakes that was made in the past and taking ownership for them. He's got older, he's more mature. He's playing at Champions League level for Lazio. He's been playing for Marseille and Hertha Berlin before that on loan from Arsenal. So fair play to the guy. Fair play. Uh, And our headline story of the day is that, according to David Ornstein, again with The Athletic, uh, Arsenal are expected to spend heavily on youth in the summer as an expectation that Arsenal could go down the route of sustainability in terms of trying to extend the competitivity of the squads into the future. And of course, thinking about players getting older, we've got a lot of players that are, of course, reaching certain ages like Thomas Partey. Of course, our midfield is full of those players, Thomas Partey, El Neni, Jorginho. There is going to need to be replacements in the future. And I think they want to improve the academy, of course, as well. But it is said that a striker remains the priority for Arsenal in that window and that Arsenal will look to try and strengthen in that centre-forward position. Who that centre-forward may be, very, very intrigued to see whether or not uh, it's a Victor Gorokarez or whether it's uh, uh, an Ivan Tony, although I doubt it is going to be, uh, an Oli Watkins, uh, Alexander Izak. Uh, lots of options that Arsenal have got. Benjamin Sesko, Evan Ferguson. Who will it be that Arsenal end up pushing to try and sign I am waiting in anticipation for the summer transfer window to get underway. And of course, you know that we'll be bringing you daily updates on everything to do with Arsenal and that transfer window. Of course, you can get involved with a brand new competition courtesy of Football Prizes. Uh, Declan Rice's signed shirt is available for you to get involved with. It is a fantastic opportunity to put quite the adornment 
on your walls at home. Uh, link to get involved in the latest competition is down in today's video description. The video is only just released and already 60 tickets of the three, just under 300 that was available have gone. There is a number of instant win prizes as well, including a Kai Havertz signed Arsenal shirt, a Daniel Ceballos signed and framed Arsenal football boot, and a £50 Arsenal club shop voucher as well as well as plenty of football prizes site credit. It's a UK-only competition, of course, so go down to the description and best of luck to all of those that get involved. Right, let's go to part two and your questions then right after this. Okay, part two. Um, and your questions, your comments in the chat box. Uh, shall we have a look at what you are saying? Um, Rob Bob says the PGMOL is a joke. The ref doesn't implement the rules of football, has zero consequences. What a terrible example of how anyone can respect referees and the PGMOL when mistakes go unpunished. Jackie says he didn't do anything wrong. I'm, I'm assuming that's in response to the referee thing, which, Jackie, if you look up the laws, he certainly did. Uh, Robert says, Tom, the agenda against us has been going on for before you were thought of. Uh, Robert going really far back in the past as well. Um, Louis says, sphere is becoming a very common TGTism. I like it. The Arsenal sphere, the footballing sphere, the social media sphere, the TGT sphere. I like it. I think it's a good word. Uh, just kind of like meaning like the community in a way and the... Uh, the, the perceivable uh, people that are in the realms of understanding what we're talking about. Um, Omar says, we gave you a second chance for that infamous touch on the Emirates pitch. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Goodness me. Uh, end of last season. Yeah, look, if it happens again this at the end of this season, I, I promise to be better. I promise to be better. Uh, Russ says, I haven't seen enough from Ferguson to suggest that he is Arsenal quality, even though he has ability. Um, and I do... I do tend to agree, uh, to be fair with this. I do, I do think that um, Ferguson is still yet to show enough for me to make me think that he is the right player for Arsenal moving forward. So I do think that there's more needed before I would drop the money that it would take to convince Ferguson to come to Arsenal. I think it would take a lot more, to be fair, to convince me. Uh, the process is, Tom, if Arteta was to move on in the future, would you go for a big name manager or go for a young coach with potential? Well, it would depend. I think that if Arteta has managed to establish himself at Arsenal as a coach that's winning trophies, a coach that's been successful, a coach that's won the league, won the Champions League, won other trophies on top of that as well, then ultimately... You've got a choice, I think. I think you can either try and go for somebody that's already established or you can look to embark upon another project and embark upon another sustainable ambition of being successful in the long term. If Arteta isn't, in the end, successful, if Arteta's next contract does not see him deliver uh, a Premier League title or a Champions League, then I think we need to go down the path where finding the coach that is going to be able to take what Arteta's built and take it to the next level. So I think it depends process about where Arsenal are when that time comes that Arteta does indeed move on either by choice or by force. Uh, Matt G says, Tom, do you think our summer transfer plans will change if we win the league? I think that Arsenal will, Matt, have a number of scenarios that they will be looking at depending upon the outcome of the season, uh, depending on where Arsenal finish in the Champions League, where they finish in the Premier League. I think the club will be planning to work out different potential pathways for them to conduct their business depending upon what they do. So I don't think they've got one plan and then that plan will have to change if we win the league or don't win the league or get knocked out in the last 16 of the Champions League or win the final. You know, I think it, they will have lots of different pathways and they will go down the pathway that fits however the season finishes, is what my prediction would be. So I guess I'm on the fence a little bit there, but I just think that's it's just the planning. So there you go. Um, Ant says, can you imagine what a player Genduzi would have been if he applied himself in the same way that potentially Saka has? I always liked his ability. There's no doubt that Genduzi was a talented footballer that had a lot of ability. He just could not marry that ability with professionality um, or professionalism, I suppose is probably a better word, uh, at Arsenal. And that ultimately cost him under Arteta. Uh, African Theory TV says, I've been looking at the striker options we could go for. And one of the most left-field suggestions would be Matthias Tell. 
He's brilliant and can play on the wings as well. The thing about Tell is that I still think there is more to be needed to be seen. He's already at a massive club at Bayern Munich as well. Yes, I think he's very talented. I think Bayern Munich want to keep him. And I think from what it sounds like, he wants to stay with Bayern as well. I think they see him as the long-term replacement when Harry Kane eventually does hang up his boots for whatever reason and Tell will be the understudy until that point. So I think that there is scope for Tell to be a Bayern starting striker in the future. And I think it would be very difficult to to kind of get him out of, of Germany. Uh, Josh says, Hi, Tom. Uh, did you know that Sheffield United has released an extended video of the 6-0 thrashing of them on their YouTube channel? <laughs> are they a glutton for punishment, are they? I'll make sure to check that one out. Uh, Thomas says, Morning, Tom. I think we should consider Watkins and Musiala. What are your thoughts? I mean, if Arsenal signed Oli Watkins and Musiala in the summer, that'd be an excellent bit of business. I saw someone suggesting in the comments yesterday that Oli Watkins wasn't good enough. I think someone tweeted me the other day saying Oli Watkins wasn't good enough. I mean, have they not watched Ollie Watkins? I know he's not fashionable. He's an English striker with a name like Ollie Watkins, you know. Uh, and I know that he's not... I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's something about English players that don't tend to spark too much, you know, inspiration. But Declan Rice. We've got a guy called Declan, and he's world-class. He's brilliant. I think people, for some reason, just don't don't find themselves gravitating towards English players as they do players from elsewhere. Watkins is brilliant. He's what he's arguably he's arguably player of the season. I think it is between him and Martin Odegaard, Bukayo Saka. Um, surely someone at Liverpool probably deserves it as well. I'm sure. I just can't think of anyone who's really necessarily stood out loads for for Liverpool. They've just been consistent. Um, Manchester City. I mean, Phil Foden, of course. I think Phil Foden's obviously up there this season as well. But don't get me wrong. Ollie Watkins is in with a shout of winning player of the year for the Premier League. Genuinely, he's been that good. He's He's been that consistent. He's absolutely in with a shout of winning it this season. How much would he cost, Matt? Um, I mean, what? How much is it left on his on his contract? That would obviously matter plenty. I think he only signed one last season, didn't he? I'm pretty sure he only signed one recently. Uh, his contract runs out in 2028, so four years. He'll be 32 when that contract finishes. He's 28 now, um, turned 28 last December. So I think that you'd have to pay. I don't think it would be 100 million, but I think it would be at least like 80, 70, 80 million. Surely Villa would like, and Villa apparently would like to, would not would like to, but may be forced to sell one of their key stars. Um, because of their financial situation, they recorded a significant loss. I think it was something like over £100 million or something in their recent accounts. Arsenal's was 50 something. So it shows you kind of the difference of where the clubs are at. They say they're still within profit and sustainability regulations, um, but uh, it's one to keep an eye on. So maybe they would accept a, a reasonable figure for, for Watkins. And without a doubt, yeah, Ayuku, he's, he's an upgrade on Jesus, 100%. 100. I mean, look at his numbers. Look at his numbers for Villa this season. 16 goals, 10 assists. It's March. That's an uh, 26 goal contributions in 27 games. He's been utterly fan. Of course he's better than Jesus. Of course he's a better striker than Jesus. He's, he's established himself as a better Premier League striker than Gabriel Jesus, without question. Without question. Um, how did he get on last season? Just kind of for the record, just so I'm curious about... The progression from last season. Um, oh, I've clicked on his achievements. That's the wrong. <laughs> that was the wrong button. Oh, the transfer Marks website just mugs you off when you're trying to click something. It throws up adverts, which is silly. Fifteen goals and six assists last season. So you know he's already got a goal more than he got last season. He's already got four more assists than he got last season. This is a guy that is that is on the rise, continually bettering what he did the season before. Season before that, 11 goals, two assists. So he's gone from 11 goals to 15 goals. He's now on 16 goals. He's in his prime. Footballers' primes now going well, especially to strikers in that regard as well, into their 30s. You're at least going to get three, four, maybe even five seasons out of Ollie Watkins. It's, I mean, Cass says I would take him over Tony. He puts Tony to shame in terms of the level, the difference between those two. Ollie Watkins is on a level above... Um, Ivan Tony, don't make any mistake about that. Uh, Derek says, does Kivior keep his place when the injuries come back? I think he suspended, cemented his place. I agree with you, Derek. I think that he absolutely has. Franklin says, I don't think we should be signing a 28-year-old based on one great... <laughs> I really hate these words. I, re I think this might be becoming my least favourite phrase in transfers after one great season. Now, Franklin, 
you're going to have to hold the L here because it is going to seem like I'm coming for you. It's not. It's more of a general thing because it's more than just you that say this. Did you not just hear me explain that last season Watkins got 14 Premier League goals? I don't think he even takes penalties, does he, for for um, for Aston Villa? I'm pretty sure that uh, Douglas Louise takes penalties, right? So, for instance, people – and I'll, I'll check this for you. I just want to check the last season quickly on um, – on FB Ref, because FB Ref will give me the answer that I'm I'm looking for. So last season, uh 2022-23 non-penalty goals. Let me have a quick look. He got goals minus penalty kicks. 14. Right? So 14 non-penalty goals. Do you know who else got 14 non-penalty goals last season? Any guesses? Any guesses who got 14 non-penalty goals last season? Yeah, Ivan Tony. Ivan Tony got 14 non penalty goals this season. This season, Watkins has now stepped that up to 16. And we say this this, this is his records, right? In the championship, he had 10 goals in 2018 19 for Brentford. In 2019 20 for Brentford, he got 25 goals, which is slightly more than Victor Goroka is. I think Victor Goroka has got 22 in his last season for Coventry. Uh, Watkins now 25. In his first season in the Premier League, he got 13 goals, non penalty, by the way. This is I'm talking about. Um, Goals and assists, he got 19 during his first Premier League season. Um, second season, uh, 10 non-penalty goals, uh, 13 uh, goals and assists that season, 2022-23, 14, 21 goals and assists. Non-penalty goals this season, 16, 26 goals and assists this season for uh, Aston Villa. I hate the phrase, one good season. A, because nine times out of 10, it's not just one good season. And B, when it is one good season, it's like people don't want to look at what's come before and see the progression up to that point and recognise that this player is clearly on an upward trajectory. They're moving in one direction, like Victor Goyokarez, for instance. They've gone from the championship of scoring around, what, 15 goals to 22 goals and then gone to sporting and scored 30 goals, you know, and you're on the upward trajectory and you're going in that direction. People are like, yeah, it's one good season. Not keen. Don't want to spend that. I'm sorry, but no. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, you, you need to get away from these classic phrases of one good season or look at the league they're playing in. No, look at the player on merit. Look at the player of what they do. Look at what they are. Don't... The factors that people go to the lengths to try and dissuade people from these players, I really don't get it. I just can't quite get it. And yet, at the same time, I'm willing to kind of jump on Evan Ferguson as like this bastion of, of obvious signing like he's got less goals and assists than Nketi has got in the Premier League this season so I don't necessarily think that you know it's it's as cut and dry as saying one good season it's not it's, it's not as easy as that uh, Global House Sitter says was watching all or nothing last night I feel sad that Smithrow isn't more part of the team I really hope he doesn't move on in the summer uh, do you think others feel the same or that fans have moved on? I think a lot of people feel that way, that they don't want uh, Smith Rhodes moved on. Uh, look, if you're honest, asking me honestly, I'd, I'd love the kid. I think he's brilliant. I wish he was more confident. I wish he'd come out of his shell a bit more. I wish he would get more opportunities as well and take them when they come better. But sometimes you've got to be ruthless. Sometimes you have to make tough calls. We've done that this season with Aaron Ramsdale, for instance, and I think we're better for it. And we're probably going to have to do the same. If you told me that Musiala's not signing and you do it by Munich and we can go out and sign Musiala to replace Emil Smith-Rowe, I'm doing it like that. It's, uh, it's It wouldn't even be a debate at all. Uh, Tommy says, we're in a good position striker-wise. We don't look desperate for one. Um, but on the flip side, every striker is going to want to play in this Arsenal side. Imagine what a top striker could do in this team. And there is intrigue for me. There is intrigue to see if we signed my number one pick in terms of Victor Gorocares, what could that do to this Arsenal team? What could having him in this Arsenal team do? I'm interested to see how Kai Havertz finishes the season. I think Kai Havertz is a fantastic option for us at the moment. Three goals in three games, five, five goal contributions in three games. Um, can he continue that form is the question. And let's not pretend that he hasn't shown up in big games. He was excellent against Liverpool in the home game as well. So don't forget that. He can turn up in the big games for us. So let's let's see um, what Kai Havertz ends up doing for Arsenal. Um, let's go to uh, Aguna Mateta says, uh, like some of our fan base, we are on the up and have got to 
uh, get players. Sorry, what? We are like some of our fan base. We on the up got to grunts in front of he's cut out of the dead. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> um, I'm trying to read the second part. He's cut out the deadwood fans back in the ground, so take the hate off him. Um, but has to deliver if not only going to be harder next season. I think that's meant to be Arteta. It's talk, I think you're talking about there. Um, yeah, and obviously he has got out the players that we didn't need and he's upgraded the squad and now he's competing for a successive title challenge. You know, it shows you the progression of this team. And I've always said that I think we need to be looking at trying to sign strikers on the up now and we should try and bring in players that are going to be moving in that direction, not players that necessarily need a revival like a Mudrick or... Someone like that, for instance. Um, Tizer says, hi, Tom. Um, it was great to hear from Edu say that they were already working on transfers and they have already moved on some of the targets after speaking with them. Uh, shows that we're going for the right attitude in terms of players as well. This is, I mean, it is great to hear it. You're right, absolutely. But at the same time, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. This is how Arsenal have acted. This is how Arsenal always act. It's how most clubs act. Actions toward the next transfer window are taken very early on. Now, it doesn't mean that necessarily those plans come to fruition always because factors change. It depends upon where you are. It depends upon what your profit and sustainability regulation situation is. It depends what your FFP situation is. It depends what you win. It depends on contract situations. It depends upon what players might want to move on. You might have a bomb dropped on you, the fact that a player might want to leave. You know, you, it's difficult. So, Planning always takes place well ahead of transfer windows, always, consistently, and has done at Arsenal that has led us to be in a position where we've grown the squad so successfully that the team that competed for second in the league last season and finished second in the league was on a lower wage than the squad that Unai Emery had. That is the difference. That is what we have done to this club. Is the club, the staff and the player costs of the squad from 2018-19 was on more than the squad that finished second in the league last season. That's the work that has been done at Arsenal. It's more this season, of course, because we've renewed contracts, we've brought players in. But uh, my goodness me, um, it is, it's been absolutely stunning to see the work that's gone on in this regard as well. Um, Mr. AFC says, Ollie Watkins is injury prone. Is he? Is he injury prone? I'm not sure he's that injury prone, is he? I'm pretty sure that he's been playing fairly consistently for quite a while. I mean, I can have a look at appearances for you if you want. This season, uh, 37 games played. Last season, 40 games played. Season before that, 36 games played. Season before that, 40 games played. Season before that, 50 games played. Season before that, 45 games played. Season before that, 48 games played. I don't think Ollie Watkins is injury prone. I mean, for a player that's injury prone, he plays an awful lot of games, Mr. AFC. Uh, Hussain says, what can, as an Eddie replacement, definitely. But as the main striker for Arsenal, he'll have to always come deep and link up play, have limited space to run in behind. Will he be ideal for that? I, I think Hussein he'd be absolutely fine with that. I mean, to say he's an Eddie replacement, he's better than Jesus. I, I implore anyone to try and have an argument about why Jesus is better than Ollie Watkins. I really do. I, I don't see how on earth that argument would go. He's a better finisher contributes more assists on a regular basis. He's a better out-and-out -out number nine. He's playing in a team that, that aren't as dominant as Arsenal, which I know a lot of you love to use as an argument sometimes. You know, when you say to me, well, look at Tony, if he joined Arsenal, <laughs> you know, what could he do? So, and he's also playing in a team that has lots of other attacking players around him, like Bailey and Diaby, and of course, previously Buendia when he was starting as well, that there was, there was goals being shared around that team. It's not just Watkins. Um, Douglas Louise chipped in plenty of goals. McGinn scores plenty of goals. So it's not like he's the, the Zaha and the Tonys where it's just like the, everything's focused on them. He contributes so much to the other players and what they do. So, I, yeah, I struggle with that a bit. I struggle with that. Um, boss, there's no update at the moment on Martinelli's injury. We'll be hearing from Mikel Arteta tomorrow. So um, that's uh, we hope we'll get an update on him tomorrow. Hopefully it's uh, it's nothing too serious. Um, Hussein says, fair enough. It'll come down to his price tag. Without a doubt, you know, if he's over £100 million, pounds, I'm not sure about that. Um, but I'm hoping that you would be able to get Watkins for between 70 to £80 million if indeed he was available, which we don't know if he's going to be yet. 
Uh, Albert JTV, good to see you, my friend, in the chat box. Good morning, Tom. You know who I want as well. Yes, of course I do. Uh, same as me. I think we're on the same queue with that one. Um, uh, Vincent says, uh, hi, Tom. After seeing Kane and Muller put three past Lazio and also based on how we've uh, played in the Premier League since Dubai, it kind of gives me some hope going into the Champions League against Porto. You should have plenty of hope. Everyone should be very optimistic about that game. I know it sucked that we lost um, in the previous round, in the previous game in Porto in really frustrating fashion. But we should be going into this game full of confidence, with full of belief and the understanding that we should be absolutely putting several goals past Porto. I don't care how good they are defensively. We should be putting... I know they scored five at the weekend against Benfica and they're, they're a good side, but we shouldn't be going out to Porto. And I want to I want to hear that Emirates crowd on an absolute different level um, to what we have previously come to expect from, um, you know, from that type of thing. Albert JTV says, good morning, Tom. You know who I would love as a striker? Bring in Goya Correa to the, to the red carpet. And yes, of course, I did press the like button. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Uh, Chilo says, a thousand of us watching, but there's less than 300 likes. What type of world do we live in? Chilo says, hit that like button. Please do. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, if you spam my chat box, you don't get your questions answered. So please don't do that. Um, Awegbu says, a right winger, backup keeper, a top striker, two midfielders, uh, Louis Zubamendi and Fafana. And that should be it for us. I tell you what, Zubamendi didn't have the best of Champions League outings again against uh, PSG in terms of like his production, in terms of his output. And I think that that game, that tie between them and PSG, is going to be used against Zubamendi whenever discussions come up about the, the Spaniard. Make no bones about it. He's a fantastic midfielder. Um, but I think that, that that tie is going to be used against him because a lot of people watched it for obvious reasons. I might do, do a little bit of diving into those games with, uh, with Zubamendi in that, but I don't think he stood out as much as maybe hope people were hoping that he would stand out for a team that was always going to be dominated, of course, by... PSG uh, and M says people are turning their nose up on Zubamendi after two lackluster performances against PSG where the entire Sociedad team were poor yet the same people were saying Arteta can fix Havertz PS I'm not Havertz bashing there indeed you got to accept that players that will arrive at Arsenal Arteta is going to be able to do you know if he signs them it's because he sees that he can get more from them as well so I look I look to that Fuad says Douglas Luiz or Zubamendi I think we need a DM more than a an eight, and I see Louise as more of an eight, to be honest, Fuad. Um, so I, I lean towards Mendy in that regard because I think he suits the position that we're going to need when Thomas Partey, I inevitably feel, does move on. Uh, Derek says, Eddie, Smithrow, Nelson, now done. Also, is Tony injured? And Buemo is back. Really tough game at the weekend as well. Um, do I think those two are probably done? Are those three? I think probably, yes. I think we'll probably see them move on in the summer. Tony, is he injured? We don't know yet. We'll hear from Thomas Frank this week. And then Buemo could be back for this game, of course. It's going to be a tough game, but I root, I back Arsenal to do the business and to be plenty competitive, you know, against Brentford. Um, Peter says, Tom, with Elneny leaving and Partey looking likely to leave as well, would you sign a new midfielder and give Patino the other slot? Patino, sadly, has just not come on at, 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 uh, at Swansea. He had a decent loan at Blackpool, but it's it's not working out at Swansea. I think he'll probably move on in the summer unless he signs a new deal, but I'd be surprised if he did. Um, talented player. Very, very talented player. Um, but I'm not sure whether or not he's developed enough to suggest that he would make it at Arsenal if that would be the right move for him next. Um, and says, Tom, you should do a poll asking if previous Arteta outs have changed their mind. It's impossible to do that poll because other people will vote on it who aren't Arteta out. You know, if you could say, if you are Arteta out, have you now changed your mind? Um, plus, I think that the majority of people that have been Arteta out, the more stubborn ones amongst the fan base and probably more proud in their view that wouldn't necessarily be changing it. So it's difficult to have that that debate. I don't think there is a debate. <laughs> no one's going to argue successfully that Arteta should be sacked at this point. Uh, Pratika said, Erdegaard was a wonder kid that Madrid didn't value. Havertz was a wonder kid that Chelsea didn't value. Arteta unlocked them. What other wonder kids should we keep an eye on? for Arteta to unlock as well. Uh, to be fair, Havertz was more of a wonder kid at Leverkusen than he was at, at Chelsea. Um, but I see what you're saying. Um, a wonder kid at another club that's not necessarily succeeded. Hmm. This is where my knowledge of, of football has become so Arsenal-centric that uh, 
I'm trying now to think of, of others. I'm sure the chat box are coming up with some really good examples, and we'll try and get to those as well if you've got them. Uh, Wonder Kids, other clubs that haven't necessarily exploded. Uh, Ansu Fati is, is a decent I, I mean, Xavi Simmons is not not in the category. He is not in the category of, of players. That would, he is a brilliant player and he's doing brilliant. Hugo Ekatike is a fantastic shout, Ben. Yeah, PSG. Haven't necessarily seen him flourish. Uh, TJR says Jaden Sancho. Anna says uh, Ferran Torres as well. Um, Rashford. <laughs> That's a funny shout. Uh, Lowell Bellingham. Yeah, good one. Good one. Uh, Aguna Mateta says, we uh, we win, we love it, we lose, we hate it, but some fans just hold on to the negative the next game that we win. They bring up the last game in negative speaking. Uh, we stay positive. Absolutely. It's a weak view. Mudrik, uh, Akmal says. Yeah, Mudrik, I guess, falls into that category as well. Uh, Mareba, yes, the Barcelona central midfielder as well. Um, he was one that was talked about heavily as being Ilax Mareba. He went to... He's at Bar RB Leipzig now, isn't he? Is he on loan? He's on loan at Hatafe this season. He played 38 games for Valencia last season, but he's only played three times for, for Hatafe this year. Uh, Arda Gula. I'm not sure if Arda Gula. I think it's too soon, Darren, on that one. Uh, Chuck De Catalaire. Is De Catalaire, is he struggling with AC Milan at the moment? I don't know. I've not really been catching up with De Catalaire as well. So I guess he's one that we'll look to maybe. He was linked to Arsenal when he was at Anderlecht. I remember. I remember our... Our resident Belgian expert when I knew in the chat box was uh, was talking about him. Maybe he's one that Arsenal would look at in the future. He's always was very, very talented. Anyway, um, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. Really appreciate your time, as always. Thank you for listening. I'll be back, of course, tomorrow morning uh, with more news, more breakdowns. And, of course, we've got our Arteta's press conference tomorrow as well. Uh, leave a comment as your thoughts on anything we've discussed today. Uh, what do you think about Ollie Watkins? I'd love to, if anyone thinks that Jesus is indeed a better centre forward than Ollie Watkins, I'd love to hear your arguments as to why. I also would like to finish today's show with a note, actually. Um, and I'm afraid it's not a positive one. And I was going to talk about it yesterday, but I thought, no, I'll focus on, um, I'll focus on the game and I'll focus on that because I don't want to bring attention to it during the talk about the game. But we were left a comment. You may have seen this on the show from. Uh, I think it was, I think it was Monday morning. I'm not going to name the person. I mean, you can see it in the comment section if you want. But they said, I won't wait for this. Uh, they said, uh, "Do you have to talk about the women's game?" I'm not trying to be sexist, but it doesn't seem a lot of people tune in to hear about the women's game. Now, I replied to this saying, "You're right. You're not trying to be sexist. You just are, because they just are." Um, for those that tune in that don't want to listen or hear or care about the women's game, that is your prerogative. That's your choice. If you don't care about women's football, I've got nothing against your likes and dislikes. I'm not going to tell you what you can or should like or dislike. Okay. I, if you don't care about women's football, that's fine. You're entitled to like what you like and dislike what you dislike. But what is not okay is jumping on public forums or public comment sections or social media and publishing and shouting for the rooftops that you don't like it, that you don't care about it. If you don't care about it, fine. But no one cares that you don't like it, that you don't like it or don't care about it. Nobody cares. And the fact of the matter is that I provide the infrastructure for people not to have to listen. YouTube provides the uh, YouTube provides the, the tools for you not to have to listen. You can fast forward what you don't want to listen to. I leave timestamps in the description for you to click to the bits of the video that you want to listen to. You are well within your rights to skip any part of this show that you don't want to listen to. And I'm not talking specifically just to this one person that has left this one comment because we've been left multiple comments. I also direct you in the direction of the show that I did with Sophie and Laura. I also joined Sophie last night on her channel um, to talk about the Sheffield United game and the wider context of Arsenal as well. But I direct you towards that show I did with Sophie and Laura so you can get a better idea about how it feels from their perspective when we see comments like that, when we see comments spoken about published like that. Because it's not nice. It's, it's not a nice feeling. It's not very Arsenal. 
It's not very community. It's not very TGT. I'm really proud of this community. It's a shame that we have people that leave comments like that. So again, just to say, you can listen to what you want to listen to. You can like what you want to like, you know, um, but you don't need to tell people. You don't need to publish it. No one cares, mate. No one cares if you don't like women's football. That's your own problem. You know, if you if you hate it, if you hate women that much that you don't like their football and that you want to talk to people about the fact you hate women's football that much, that's your own problem. And keep it to yourselves. Anyway, thank you for listening, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Do drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new around here with those notifications turned on so you never miss it. Help us to get to 1K likes every single day. I very much appreciate it. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8 a.m. once again to round you up on all the latest Arsenal news. Stay safe, stay well, stay happy and respectful, especially listening to that last word. And as always, up the Arsenal. <laughs>